All right, I think we can get started. I'm Debbie Doyle. I'm the meetings manager here at the American Historical Association. Thank you for attending our session, Shifting How History is Taught, a dialogue to inspire instructional innovation in secondary and higher education, which is part of the AHA colloquium series of virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the AHA, or if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in AHA webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but also need to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA, AHA hashtag. And finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording on our YouTube channel sometime after the session. Now I'll turn things over to Craig Perrier from Fairfax County Public Schools who will be chairing the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. And thank you to everybody who is joining us today. Uh, we have a great panel. We're excited to be here. We're excited to have you here. Um, we we, uh, we want to get to know who, who's in the room with us. We want to uh, also take, take a moment to introduce ourselves so you get to know who we are to open up uh, today's presentation. So uh, a poll will be, will be shared with you shortly uh, so you can identify what your, your best role is, what best identifies your role so we have an idea of who you are. We will have a few other interactive um, you know, possibilities during this, this presentation and for after the presentation as well. So stay tuned, stay tuned for those. Um, so let's, let's just take a moment to, uh, to introduce ourselves and then we will transition into kind of a quick tour of a Google site we have, we have prepared for today's presentation so you can take it with you and all the excitement you have, you can share with your friends and your colleagues and strangers and whoever you wanna share it with. It's, it's gonna be great stuff. So uh, I'll, I'll just start it off. My name is Craig Perrier. I am currently the uh, in curriculum instruction specialist for social sciences and history in Fairfax County Public Schools. Uh, Fairfax uh, County is one of the largest counties in, in the United States, the 10th largest. And we roughly have 500, between 500 and 550 high school social studies teachers. So a lot of what I'm sharing with you today will be um, uh, experiences they've had and they've shared, and uh, it's a combination of, of those combined experiences. Um, Trevor, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself? Thanks, Craig. Uh, I'm Trevor Getz. I'm a professor of history at San Francisco State University. Uh, I've taught the uh, World History Survey many times, uh, but I'm also a content lead, one of the content developers for the OER project, which includes the World History Project and the Big History Project. That's given me an opportunity to work with a lot of high school teachers, uh, many of whom have been teaching me. And I'm going to be talking today, hopefully, partly about vertical integration uh, across uh, sort of the, 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 the 10th through 14th grades. Uh, Jennifer? I almost did the talking without unmuting myself thing. Uh, I'm Jennifer Hart. I'm an associate professor in the history department at Wayne State University. And I'm among the various hats I wear, the ones most relevant today are that I'm the coordinator for the history communication initiative in our department, I'm the chair of the general education oversight committee at Wayne State, and the North American president for the International Society for the Scholarship on Teaching and Learning in History. And I'll be talking about kind of public facing uh, scholarship in the classroom. Uh, Joseph, I guess. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Joe Sebastian. Uh, I am currently an assistant principal at Hampton Township School District at high school. Uh, it's a basically medium sized suburban school district just north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I used to be a social studies teacher. I consider myself still in, involved in social studies. Uh, and um, I used to be, at, my, my longest tenure was with Fairfax County Schools. That's how I loosely know Craig. <laughs> uh, we've developed a good relationship over the years, kind of throwing around some ideas. So I'll be talking about uh, teaching evaluation of sourcing and documents. Uh, looking forward to speaking on that later. Back to you, Craig. 
All right, thank you everybody for the introduction. I, I failed to, to give a quick summary of what I, of my presentation or my part of, the, of today's panel will be on. I'm gonna take a little deep dive into using a visible thinking routines in history classes. So more to come on that. All right, we got some great results from, our, from the poll. We have, I think almost half of us, half the participants are from our, our higher ed professors. What you're gonna to experience today, we think will, will transcend K to 16 you know, education. So uh, let's transition into our Google site. So I've, I'm gonna post a Google site again. If you haven't accessed it yet, please do. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen to give you a quick tour of what you see on a, on a very simple, but we hope useful Google site for today's presentation. So um, what you're seeing is uh, the home page here, and I'm going to scroll down just to give you a look at a quick look at uh, what's on this page. You have our Twitter information, um, but I want to I want to uh, take a moment to identify what our time together will look like. So we're in this first segment of 15 minutes of an overview and Google site tour. That's where we are now, and then we've kind of just perfectly. Um, you know, section it off into 15 minute increments. So every presentation will be 15 minutes. I'll be the timekeeper just to keep people uh, aware of how much time they have left. And then we have um, time for an open discussion. We'll, we'll, we'll try to answer any, any questions you have the best we can. More on that to come on how, if we don't get to your question. Um, and then some possible ideas for next steps. Uh, this is our belief about what our panel, um, you know, the goal of our panel today. Uh, I'll give you a moment to, to look through that and, and, why, and read through that. Well, why I'm doing that, I wanted to emphasize really that, that, last, that last paragraph. Um, we, we have a shared belief that timing is right for, for impacting history education. And to do that, it needs to be strategic, you know, it needs to be intentional. Um, and, and one of the qualities of that is having the, having a, the instructor, the facilitator, the teacher to embrace a, a design approach to to instruction, right? So that you're designing experience and giving time for students to, to, to do something, to engage in some activity. Um, so more on that in each, uh, each of the uh, individual uh, presentations as we scroll up to what is really gonna be um, the bulk, I think, of, of where you'll be active in our, in our Google site. This is our presentation toolkit site. So everything you see in here today that we presented is in one of these four toolkits. Right, each, each presentation has one. Um, unless otherwise noted, um, you should feel free to share anything in there, um, you know, modify it as you see fit. If there's limitations to that, I ask the panelists to, to please uh, express that. But uh, from my end, you, you'll be able to use anything um, in the visible thinking routines for your, for your purposes, just to modify them uh, and, use, and share them out. And then lastly here, there's a, a, a tab called networking. We're, we're, Excited about this as way to stay connected after, you know, after the presentation. So what we've done there is we we pr provided a, a Padlet, a real simple tool, tech tool for you to use. And if you click on that, uh, as it comes up here, you'll notice a pink plus button here. If you click on that pink plus button, you'll be you'll be able to add your information. You can see some people have already. Uh, we have so we have some present we have. Our, uh, people are doing it now, so you get the idea. So if you are on this uh, on this Padlet, we will do a follow up and try to stay networked uh, together for post um, post presentation and, and create a kind of a small little network uh, uh, using uh, using the Padlet option. It's totally optional; you don't have to use it, but it has our information as well on there for you to use. Great. So um, I think everyone, uh, I think we've covered that. The Google site, um, Trevor, Jennifer, or Joe, any comments before we get into our first presentation? Okay, wonderful. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Trevor. And Trevor, I'll, you know, maybe we'll give you an extra two minutes here with the additional time, but uh, it's all you. Thanks, Craig. It may take me two minutes to uh, figure out how to get all my tech going. Nope, managed to do it. Uh, that's a victory to begin with, uh, and also means that. That, uh, that adrenaline at the beginning of the presentation can begin to subside. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to, to be speaking with you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us. Um, I wanna start by saying that I have had uh, two big debates in my mind uh, in the last little while as I'm, I'm thinking about my teaching and the, the broader issues. One is 
Um, how intentional uh, should be our teaching and assessment design? Um, how planned out should we be? Um, as a college instructor, I began loosely planned. I learned from high school teachers, I think, uh, to a large degree, how to do understanding by design, backward design, inquiry-based design. Um, at the same time, I've had great success at times giving students a lot of freedom um, and kind of letting them learn in directions that interest them, uh, helping, letting them kind of set the pace for the course. So I'm, I'm trapped in between these two extremes. The second is about vertical integration. And quite simply, um, I see a lot of students coming through high school world history surveys in my case, and then college world history surveys, and really thinking about how we can use that as an opportunity for students to uh, be able to move through, for students to be able to uh, develop and strengthen their skills uh, over time. So both of those are going to be addressed a little bit today as I talk about scale switching, which I think is an underappreciated skill for study and for use in, in, in both high school and college classes. So um, what do I mean by scale switching? Um, I've actually been working with Craig a little bit on this, but you know, uh, scale is both time and space. Scale switching is really a disciplinary practice within history that we all use where we move between collect, analyze, evaluate, integrate evidence from different scales in order to, to, to make meaning. So we do it. We do it, I think, uh, most often as historians and as people who are educated in history, we do it quite naturally. Um, and uh, as we go through, I'm gonna try to identify some of the important texts about teaching scale switching and just pull from them. Um, many cases I'm pulling from AHA presidents as it happens. Um, but here I'm, I'm pull, pulling from uh, an article that is more focused on sort of the question of disciplinary skills in the world history classroom as it happens. And asking the question, um, what are the advantages of scale switching? Um, we learn how to generalize from specific evidence. Uh, we learn how to evaluate and connect human agency on the one hand and bigger global structures on the other hand. We learn how to contextualize local events within the wider trends in which they're set. And as I said, you know, we all, we all do this. I think everybody here knows how to do this. Now, um, when I was a grad student, I was affected by reading Thomas Holt's AHA presidential address in 1994, um, which looks at the levels problem, if you will, in history. And what Holt says, and what I think stuck with me is that um, when we tell macro level histories without scale switching, we end up, um, not focusing on, not learning from, not seeing that history is about human experience. Um, we can identify patterns perhaps, but they're rendered somewhat meaningless by missing out on these essential uh, kinds of human experiences, local culture making action um, that, that, are, that are really in, in many ways the subject that we wanna get at. On the other hand, when we only tell local stories without understanding the global or larger contexts, um, we don't necessarily learn lessons that can render this, this, this behavior knowable within the sort of wider framework of, of, of humanity. And, and the result in both cases is something that is, I think, uh, sort of uh, inferior to when we do, when we do scale switch. So, um, so we, should, we should be, I think, intentional about our scale switching. We should also be intentional about how we teach scale switching. So here, here's Pat Manning's 2017, uh, 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 article on the theme of the of the annual meeting, um, the HA annual meeting, in which he said, look, we, we all kind of know what scale is, um, but we don't actually fully establish, with, we don't have a shared vocabulary necessarily. We all periodize, we all talk about the classical age or whatever, um, but we leave it pretty amorphous. And the same is true when we say, oh, local and regional and global. Um, we should be intentional about the way that we study these things. Um, we should maybe be a bit more explicit about it. And this turns out to be uh, important because of what I think we identify as the problem for our students. Um, and here's how I want to identify that problem. So first of all, um, we find that students tend to think that periodization and scale are intrinsic, right? That a period is a real thing, that it is a solid thing. Um, that the same with the scale, a locality, a state, or whatever, that these are, these are natural structures. Um, and we find we have to work 
to get students to understand that these are constructed not out of nothing, right? They're meaningful, but that they are they're constructed. And second, that even when we work with students to understand that, even when we teach them to move across scales, students tend to abandon that, right? So when we study what students actually do, they abandon that practice if it's not extensively taught. Um, and finally, um, when students do use small bits of local evidence, for example, to answer broader questions, um, they tend to do so less critically than we would in our practice, right? They tend to say, I know that X was true globally because I found a source that said that this person in this place uh, you know, was X. Um, and we need to help them to understand the significance across those scales. So what I've been working on is I've been working on how we can uh, move towards um, uh, developing, I think, a broader framework for, for teaching and learning and scale switching. Um, and perhaps you'll find it a little bit too uh, directed, um, but I want to kind of prepare for you. I also don't have enough time to talk today really necessarily about classroom moves, um, although I'll talk about that a little bit, um, but I do want to save time to talk about vertical integration between high school and college. So here's my little schematic, if you will, right? And you could do this backwards, uh, I would argue, um, the other way, but um, I have six, I think, skills here that I think students should develop working with scale switching. I'm not going to read them here because I'm going to go into each one uh, in depth, but they begin with reflection and end really with sort of application and demonstration and something solid. Um, but as I said, you could go kind of backwards. So let's start with the, the first one. So the first one is that both at high school and college, students need to understand that they themselves are embedded within multiple scales of time and place. Um, and I'm gonna let Yehura Williams talk about this a little bit because when I, I saw this video, I thought he did so so well and you can get a break from my voice in that way. So uh, here's Yehura Williams talking about the multiple meanings of scale. And in order to do that, I wanna talk about the multiple meanings of scale. I wanna talk about scale um, not just in terms of John Lewis, but all the people that we'll talk about today, in terms of how we experience the past as individuals, how we think about how the past influences our family, our community, our nation, and our world. And in the process, how we invite young people to also step into the role of looking at scale in that degree. But I want to begin with this idea of scale as perspective. And when we talk about it in that sense, we are all in some sense products of our own biography. What Okay, so someone just told me that they can't hear, and I, I hope that wasn't universal, but what, what Yehura Williams is saying, and I do urge you to go and watch this keynote address, which is available online. Um, what Yehura Williams is saying is in fact that um, uh, we are all products of histories that are operating on multiple scales. And he starts that by talking about John Williams, um, but then he moves in and, and talks about our students. And this is my first point, that we need to help our students reflect on themselves as nested in this sort of uh, broader sense of scales. And for me, that's the starting point. My second argument then is that um, students should appreciate that, that, that scale is something that historians and others negotiate. This is an activity from the Big History Project. It's one that I particularly like. It's aimed at, at young students, really, uh, lower high school. Um, it's one that I know the Big History Project folks are working on changing to some degree because uh, it doesn't include some Islamic scholars that should fit in there, and we're going to talk about that issue later. But um, what it does is it helps students see that even understandings of the universe, the size of the universe, and you know where we are within this sort of biggest scale thing have changed over time, have been socially negotiated, have been influenced by changing science, um, these sorts of things. So. I think denaturalizing each scale helps a little bit. The third scale, and the one that I have to admit I'm sort of most personally obsessed with, is um, the idea of using sources, using sources at smaller scales to help answer big questions, right? To bring them together. This is from the World History Project, some stuff that I worked on myself. Um, and it includes, so we, we wanted students to understand for the most recent past, uh, about globalization, um, how it has changed lives um, and how it has changed lives differently in different places and how different people have reacted to them. And so I have two pieces of evidence that we put together here. One is um, 
uh, individual stories uh, uh, of two Ugandan migrants that are part of these stories of, of individual migrants that we have, one of whom, uh, for whom uh, going to work in the UAE was very positive, uh, positive part of, uh, of, of, of globalization, the other more negative. Um, and then the second one is a broader scale look at global income distribution. I'm gonna have to go really much faster here, Craig. Sorry, I'm gonna do it. Um, another great example of that I just wanna uh, talk about is the sites of encounter in the medieval world site, which you can find very easily in the California History Social Science Project in which they ask students to extrapolate about the wider uh, medieval world by looking at what's going on in six sites of encounter. I'm not gonna be able to stop there. Um, on the other hand, I want students to be able to develop a skill of understanding uh, large scale events and how they impact the life and experience of individual humans. And this is part of the story of Aben and the Important Men, uh, my graphic novel, in which I try to have students you know, look at changing things over long periods of time and in local scopes and in global scopes together to contextualize her life and, and, and help us to understand her. My, I think second to last uh, probably is uh, to ask students to um, understand the interplay between human agency and broader structures. And here I'm gonna steal from Bob Bain for a second. Um, Bob Bain uh, has stolen himself from Braudel uh, to say, um, you know, we know we can, we can help students understand their big events um, that we can call these long durée currents that humans, individual humans have trouble shifting. Um, and then there are these tides right, that we can look at in shorter periods. And then there are these individual events where we can see humans having more of an impact and we can analyze these levels. Um, and the final one to um, understand how, um, how shifting scales allows us to become more inclusive. And my example here has to do with the Atlantic revolutions and the way we teach them, which we be began with teaching the French revolution and the US revolution and then R.R. Palmer, amongst others, said, let's put these together and look at these sort of global shifts. And then C.L.R. James said, yeah, yeah, that's very nice. You left out Haiti because it doesn't quite fit, right? Uh, what if we fit it in there? Well, how will it change things? And it did, it changed things. And then just recently, Vincent Brown says, what if we need to look at this as a longer term war in part um, and include this, you know, the Haitian revolution is culminating this longer term war between the enslaved and enslavers. And Paul Lovejoy says, what about West Africa? It didn't quite fit into your scheme either, but it's also an Atlantic revolution and here's how it might help us to modify. So by doing that, you're becoming more inclusive, which is important, um, but becoming more inclusive also makes it more accurate and allows us to ask sort of questions. So as I'm running out of time, I'll just give these two very quick examples of vertical integration I've been thinking of. Um, one is that students who engage theory about scale at college um, if they've gotten examples of working with this in high school, they do very well. Um, if, if, if they don't, uh, they don't do as well. So um, how can we engage at high school so that students learn the basics of just ideas that, um, that there are these you know, different scales that work and, and, and by college they're able to undertake uh, projects that actually then uh, allow them to be a bit, a bit more free in choosing their own topics to engage. Um, similarly, my other example is um, I've seen some great projects at high school in which students use evidence at various scales to support or challenge particular ideas like there was a dark age, for example, right? Um, and boy, when you start moving into Asia, you go, was there a dark age? Um, when was the dark age? And there's a lot of good literature on that. It's a great high school experience by college students maybe being able to choose their own periodization to critique go out and do their own research on the contemporary literature um, and do the critique themselves. Um, so I guess that I rushed through that, but I think I made it time-wise. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there and just say, I'd be glad to have any questions in the future uh, and turn things uh, back over to Craig, I think. Right, Craig? Yeah, we actually have a, a minute or so left. Um, Debbie, do you see any Q&A or any Q and A regarding scale shift that has po that popped up during Trevor's presentation? And I, I don't think anything came up. Uh, oh, well, I can't see Q and A, so I shouldn't answer. 
That's okay. No, that's fine. We'll, we'll, um, we'll come back. Victor said none, but we, we okay, great. So no, oh, Trevor, thanks for, thanks for starting us off. And I'm going to use um, I started my time here to um, share kind of a bridge story. Uh, Trevor is Trevor is going to be our uh, the keynote speaker at an upcoming um, six district school district um, consortium in Virginia uh, called just called the Virginia Inquiry Consortium. It's uh, six school districts of which Fairfax is one of them. Um, disciplinary uh, the disciplinary um, um, practice of scale shifting is gonna be the unifying approach for all our teachers as they go and design uh, inquiries using the C3 inquir inquiry model. I'm not sure if folks know that, but um, that is, uh, that's in a really intentional practice. And, and the key word here is intentional for us to help uh, impact and change how world history is taught uh, using scale shift at the, at the macro level and the micro level that Trevor mentioned in order to expand voices and, ex and expand uh, interpretation of the past. So that's, that's, that's coming up in the next couple months and in the next year we'll have our inquiries published for the, anyone, to, anyone to you. So if you're part of our Padlet, you'll, you'll get that get update from us as, far, as part of our network. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go right to our um, right to our Google site. Um, I have uh, and, and into our toolkit so that I can reference things right there. And I just want to give you give folks a heads up that you're gonna have time some time today just to do some exploration on visible thinking. So first thing, I just want to go to the visible thinking um, uh, toolkit here. And as we as we sit here for a little bit, um, I, I just want to share a quick uh, story about how visible thinking routines can be part of our practice in in Fairfax and is a is a continuing growing practice uh, among our teachers. So it's roughly about three years ago, I would say, that um, visible thinking routines became a really intentional part of our professional learning for student for teachers of the resources we created. And then teachers either already had that knowledge or many teachers didn't and then took off and started to really uh, incorporate visible thinking routines into their work. So a quick, a quick um, two things really come as far as a foundation for using visible thinking routines. And I'll define those in a second, but two kind of underlying thoughts are, one is um, that uh, learning is a product of thinking, right? So if you, if you want students to learn you know, content and dispositions and, 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 and ways of thinking, you have to be really intentional and use these and use routines to get kids to think. Um, the thinking routines under, in that, under, under that umbrella expanded a teacher's instructional repertoire immensely. You, you're gonna see why in a second. On the, on the number of thinking routines that have been put out by Project Zero from Harvard University, that's, that's the uh, founding organization of these. Uh, the instructional practices just it augments immensely and, and with intent, you know. And the other, the other one is something. That, the other practice, another principle I, I already mentioned is that uh, it really goes. It fits well into the idea of teacher as a designer of a learning experience, as opposed to a haphazard. You know, what do I do now? Or as opposed to, um, you know, I'm going to improv it or wing it. I, I'm going to have intentional time devoted to having asking kids to think during class. Right, or as part of their out of class work. So those are two really key principles. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna click on the first, on the, on the Google doc here in the toolkit. So you get, you get an idea and you're welcome to join along and, and just click along with me. Uh, you can see that I've provided here a um, kind of an overview of what Project Zero is and, and all these are hyperlinked here. Um, and, and specifically hyperlinked to Project Zero's uh, thinking routines, their own toolbox, which is all of their resources. And then also a newly released item called At Home with PZ, At Home with Project Zero, which is uh, really designed for digital learning settings. I think that all of us have, have you know, gone into that, into that arena. Um, but what I'm sharing with you today and what's really unique as part of today's presentation is down below. And what you'll see here are, it's only the tip of the iceberg. It's only 12 thinking routines, but there are 12 thinking routines that are, are crafted using Google Sheets or Google Slides so that you can use them with your students. This is the part of the, the toolkit where I'm inviting you just to say, whatever you see here, and I'll click on a few in a second, whatever you see, 
use. Uh, take, you know, uh, use, uh, click on the file tab, make a copy and use them with your, use them with your colleagues and use them with your students and modify them as you see fit. I've been intentional on the selection of these because I wanted to um, identify ones that tend to go, I think, fairly well with history classes. Um, the, 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 arguably, they all go well with history classes, but I wanted just to kind of um, identify a few that we highlight in our curriculum resources as well. So uh, I'm going to click on the, uh, one of my favorites. This is a, and, and you'll see that the type of thinking is very different. But if you click on I used to think, now I think, what you see is a Google Slides plat approach. Uh, the, the opening slide is um, an, exp an, explanation sh an explanation slide. And then beyond that, you have um, just slides that are already, already created for you that you can just use with your students based on whatever topic uh, what, or whatever document or whatever, you know, even about your you know, a lecture, you know, I, before, you, before I, I engaged with this uh, stimulus, I used to think this about the topic. And now I had this, in, I had this interjection, this, this input, and now how has my thinking changed? So you can just by starting here, you can see it's a really intentional type of thinking, right? This is hence the, hence, hence the visible thinking routine. Uh, when juxtaposed to what I did in the classroom back in the 90s and early 21st century, uh, I would often finish and maybe use something like this. Do you have any questions, <laughs> right? Or are there any questions? Or how can I be clearer, right? And it's not as intentional, right? It's not as inviting and it's not teaching kids how to think. Right, so this is this is a really purposeful way to, to use um, thinking routines with uh, historical content. Uh, another one I want to highlight here, and then I'm going to pause and give you guys a few minutes to look at the other ones, is the one that's called parts, people, and interaction, interactions. And the reason I'm highlighting this is that Visible Thinking Project Zero's big toolkit, back with one of the main links, has kind of like three or four of these dedicated to interaction in society. Uh, they all kind of start with parts. There's part people, there's parts, people, and systems. I think there's parts, people, and complexities. You, you get the idea, but these are really good for, I think, I think putting uh, any kind of processes or, or, or event or idea or group into um, either a, could be a large scale, right, society to connect with, with Trevor, and also gets it down to um, possibly more of an individual uh, scale with me. So same thing, you can see the slide. You can also see that the slides after these are already kind of laid out. Feel free to modify as you see fit. Uh, one last thing, and then I, I, I promise I will uh, turn it over to you to explore for about two minutes, is the see, think, me, we. Oh, no, I'm sorry, my, my mistake there. Um, is word, yes, word, phrase, sentence. This is a real simple literacy, um, I guess literacy-based um, thinking routine. The reason I wanted to show you this is it's another format. It's a Google, it's Google Sheets, right? Instead of uh, instead of the slide deck, so you have these two kind of formats. Um, I have at my time um, roughly I think about eight minutes left, or oh no, six and a half minutes left. I'm going to pause here for about two minutes and give you some time to explore uh, other uh, other thinking routines on this page, and then I'll come back and I'll wrap up with some some other ideas. So two minutes of just kind of free exploration before we come back. These are awesome. I just shared them with our OTL. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I don't want to interrupt your silent time, but I'm just, I mean, I'm thinking about these in terms of also, you know, kind of progressions from high school to college also.
Um, I just want to share one other aspect of the toolkit. I've, I've gathered some videos about, about Project Zero and about visible thinking routines. This is really great to kind of orient yourself with um, uh, what Project Zero is. On this first one, what, vis what visible thinking is, you have um, Ron Richard, who is really I, I identify as one of the main founders of visible thinking routines. Uh, this is also kind of a short, maybe seven minute video. And then you have a really kind of long webinar from 2015 where the Library of Congress used visible thinking routines with, with primary sources uh, as, their, as their tool. So you, th that's also for you to, to explore when you have time. The select routines here are just the routines that are in that table back on back here. I've just I've created them in that folder. Uh, once again, if you're part of our palette and I add more of these, you know, you'll you'll get access to more in the format formats that we have. Um, I'm gonna come back live here. I think my computer might be going a little bit slow. Oh no, I might have froze up here. Oh here we go. Okay. Greg, did we lose you? I think Craig may have run into some technical uh, issues and I'm not sure, can I just ask my panelists, should we move on to the next presentation and then come back to Craig? I, I, I think so. Jennifer, you're next, right? If I remember correctly. Sure. Um, yeah, we'll definitely wanna uh, want to come back to, to Craig in just a minute. Um, hopefully he is, oh yeah, he had to duck out. So hopefully he'll be able to reconnect shortly. Um, so I, I wanted to talk today about some opportunities to think about how to engage the public in the history classroom. And this comes out of uh, and a series of things that I'm involved in, but uh, particularly the emerging field of history communication, which I'll talk a bit, a bit more about in just a second. So um, just so you know, uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, so if you want more information about this or you wanna see uh, kind of what, um, what some of this conversation looks like in real time after this presentation or wanna be in conversation, please connect with me there. Um, and there is this hashtag, histcom. So if you wanna be part of that larger conversation, um, feel free to, to add that in. Um, so when we think about public, uh, public engagement in the classroom, or we think about kind of the public and scholarship, there's a range of ways, a range of kind of categories and, and descriptions of what that looks like, including scholarly communication, public scholarship, engaged scholarship, public humanities, public history, applied history, um, which is one of my preferences, um, digital humanities, which overlaps several of these categories and informs them in many ways. Um, these are all slightly different, um, slightly different things, but they all share this kind of commitment to engaging the public in various ways in scholarship, whether that is, um, whether that is translating scholarship for a general public, producing scholarship intentionally for a public, um, you know, using the kinds of, um, the kinds of resources we have to and apply as historians to apply them to public pro problems, um, or using to, you know technologies from other sorts of fields like the like the digital um, and applying it to historical analysis in new ways. Um, and so you know these again these slides as we've mentioned before will be up on the Google site, um, so you can see, you can read this in more detail. I know it's a lot of text here. Oh, and good Craig's back. <laughs> we'll 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 circle back. <laughs> um, so this uh, my engagement with a lot of this comes in part from digital humanities, but also from this emerging field of history communication. And so this is a new field that um, that brings together historians and people interested in history uh, from other fields around the idea that uh, we we can share we can and should share historical knowledge with non-experts. And the way that we do that is changing in part because of the various kinds of digital resources available to us. And that in order to do that appropriately, we need to be intentional and innovative and skilled about the way that we communicate with audiences through various kinds of media. 
And, and this notion of history communication is inspired in large part by science communication. And it sits in this kind of um, sometimes uh, uneasy place between the notion of history in public and public history um, and, and seeks to kind of maybe um, be a bridge in certain, in certain ways between these different ways of thinking about what public engagement looks like. So public history is a, is a kind of often um, bracketed fields that, that we associate with like museum, museum work and, and other sorts of things, but is obviously much broader than that. And then kind of history in public where we think maybe about, you know, things like the History Channel or, um, or history documentaries or other sorts of things. Um, so this, this new field was in many ways spearheaded by a guy named Jason Steinhauer, who uh, worked at the time at the Kluge Center uh, at the Library of Congress and, and gathered some people together in a series of workshops in part under the umbrella of the AHA, as well as the National Council on Public History, um, to have this conversation about what history communication might look like and how it might work um, in the history classroom and in history curricula. And there's inf more information about that on their website. Um, so the goals of something like history communication are to, you know, communicate complicated historical research in a variety of media forms, identify an audience and construct projects that will engage that audience, classify the various kinds of public for history work, construct a portfolio of work in history communication, and create a social media or online presence. Um, some projects, some, some variations or versions of history communication um, might not do all of these things, um, but, but in general, these are kind of umbrella um, goals or learning outcomes for a history communication curriculum of some sort. Um, so, you know, HISCOM embraces a wide range of skills and technologies and platforms, right? Anything from basic historical thinking and digital and media literacy to teamwork and marketing and project management to any of the array of kind of social media, podcast, kind of digital platform, um, things that we have available to us, including graphic histories, uh, like my friend Trevor engages in. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are, it, it's, a, it's a big wide ranging um, kind of field of opportunity and possibility. And I think history communication helps us in certain ways in bringing all this stuff together that sometimes we think about in very different ways. Um, and it helps us focus on the idea that there's method behind the, these activities and there's, there's intentionality behind them and there's various ways that we can engage them in really explicit and intentional ways in our curriculum in our classroom. Um, so there are challenges to doing student work in public um, as well as opportunities. Um, and I really appreciated this statement by Caleb McDaniel, who's a professor at Rice University on his digital history, for his digital history pro um, course, says, um, you know, wrote this really helpful, lovely statement about how, you know, this, a, a course that engages in digital history, history communication, or, or any of these kinds of um, quote unquote unusual uh, history uh, forms, I guess, might seem really different. And that might make students uncomfortable in certain ways. Um, and it's about going beyond simply learning course content and to apply their knowledge to make things. And um, sometimes that's really challenging for students, uh, especially when you're, when you're pushing them to think beyond an essay, right? So there's a lot of conversations about an essays now. And I think a lot of us who are part of those conversations know that there's there's a lot of student anxiety around um, you know demonstrating knowledge outside of, of a conventional essay form. Though I think our colleagues in K through 12 history and K through 12 education are way ahead of um, those of us in university education in that. Um, so this requires students to take responsibility for the final product um, as well as kind of what we produce in the class. Um, they have to attain technical skills, sometimes they have to do, you know, some work themselves, they have to be okay with DIY moments, they have to um, understand that not, you're never working alone, you're always part of a team, people aren't co competitors, they're collaborators, right, um, and that this work would be done in public, having, um, having an audience and somebody that's not just the instructor is a powerful motivator and sometimes helps students think in really profoundly different ways about what they're doing and its application, right? So particularly right now, we're having all these conversations about the, the value of, of history education and, and what it means um, 
what it means to to students and and why people should you know major in history, for example, right? And why universities should invest in in history departments and and other sorts of things. I this this idea that that there is an audience beyond your instructor, there is an audience beyond just you as an, as a student or other cl classmates in your in your class in your course. There are other people, and that they as students can be part of that process of like having a public conversation about history, an informed public conversation about history that has real implications in the present. Um, so what I what I particularly love about this statement is that all of the things in the course that they will be doing that seem like challenges aren't actually new, that they seem unfamiliar in a humanities course because we often in the humanities, uh, you know, emphasize individual and private reading. Um, but they are things that they often do in STEM courses, right? This is not in any way unusual for them in other kinds of things, in other kinds of courses that they're taking. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is a powerful way to get students to think very differently, again, about the value of history and its, its utility on a regular basis to kind of upend some of those assumptions and, um, and issues. So um, as part of kind of educating or talking to students about history communication, you have to engage some lessons, right? Um, I don't think, you know, we, we often talk about digital natives and assume that these kinds of projects will be intuitive to students and they'll always know exactly how things work and they, um, they'll know how to do it. And, and, you know, there's lots of scholarship that says that that's not necessarily true, that, um, that this doesn't always work as smoothly as we would think. And um, I think, you know, the, the kind of politics of speaking out, the idea that there are controversial topics in history that, um, pe that the public has very strong opinions about, um, and the importance always of citing your sources and acknowledging the work of other people, particularly when you're doing it in public, is, is so critical and are, are really um, powerful moments and lessons that we can use these activities to teach students in new ways. Um, because I think, especially for social media projects or projects in the public, they feel that more immediately, right? They know what trolling is. Um, so, you know, there are risks, right? Trolling and doxing is a risk. Um, student privacy can also be a risk. Those student grades don't have to be public, right? Um, and, and there's always the option of allowing students, if they're not comfortable, to do stuff privately and create password protected projects. Um, there also may be institutional rules and regulations about what um, what you're allowed to do and whether you can have sites or projects that are outside of university or um, or K through 12 institutional structures. Um, so those are all kinds of things that you have to navigate. And often our institutions have not quite kept up with uh, with these kinds of curricular innovations. And so they don't quite know what to do with us yet. And, uh, and so sometimes it's a little bit of um, asking forgiveness rather than asking permission. Um, so I did want to kind of wrap up by by talking about a couple of things. And, and one is the idea of history communication lab, that, that history doesn't always just take place in the library, that, um, that the act of doing this, you know, publicly and engaging with the technology ourselves, even if we're not experts, right? Even if that means bringing other people in to help our students navigate learning how to do this, um, that it's really powerful. And you can do that in various ways, right? Teaching through best practice examples, teaching through making, teaching through failure and imperfection and struggle, which is not something that historians are very, are very open about often. Um, you know, decentering the instructor so that students are, have a much more powerful role in shaping the conversation and the ultimate product. Um, and also the possibility that this is something that can be done outside of the classroom. That, that this is something that you can absolutely incorporate into your classroom, but it's also something that can be done outside of the classroom as an extracurricular activity or part of summer programming as a way to continue to engage students without it feeling like a class. Um, so there's many pathways here, right? Um, individual assignments through, um, through uh, traditional history courses is something that I do certainly, um, history communication e-portfolios, um, that last picture that you saw is a picture of our department history communication lab, which you can see is quite small, uh, but has a website. Um, there's a history communication course, which I offered, and there's information about that on the Google site. Um, you can have tracks within existing programs, a BA program. Uh, we have an MAPH program that has a track. 
um, for digital history and history communication. You can have tracks within PhD programs. And you can make this kind of work central to public humanities, next gen PhD and career diversity initiatives, similar to the kinds of things that the, the AHA has supported, certainly in our department among many others. Um, so there's a lot of possibility there. There's a lot of richness and I'm happy to talk about, sorry, I'm happy to talk about what any of that looks like um, in greater detail, but, um, there, and there's also some examples on the Google site of some student work that my students have done in previous classes that you can see, as well as up on our um, history communication lab site. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Joe, do you mind if I eat into your time just like a few few seconds? I had no, please. Do. Oh, Sorry about time. that. Um, so, Sorry, I got bumped off. I don't know what I said. Someone bumped me off. No, I'm just joking. Sorry, sorry, I lost contact. But I just want to finish up with a couple of points. And uh, the first point is um, put in the chat box right now. There's there's two. Uh, if you're into Twitter, it is a robust educational uh, culture and environment around visible thinking routines. I've linked Ron Richards' uh, website, uh, Twitter Twitter handle. Sorry. Uh, and I've also used the hashtag visible thinking that will generate ideas. It'll provide examples uh, beyond what you've seen already uh, from, from in my toolkit. Uh, and then I want to finish with uh, just kind of a summary of what have I seen change over time using visible thinking routines in our in our classes. So a couple of years back, and this was really informed by some AHA um, some research. Uh, we I, I share with our teachers that the uh, the frequency that a uh, that universities are asking students to take a history course in college has been decreasing. Um, if you pair that with um, certain states having only maybe two courses you need to take uh, in high school, that, that, that the, there's, there's possibly an even uh, low, lesser amount of kids taking a formal course in history. Uh, if you combine those, it's quite possible that the last time a student will take, and this is, this is really especially for our K-12 uh, teachers here and administrators, um, the it's quite possible the last time a student will take a formal history course is in high school, right? And that means we should do it right and, and do, or do it better. And part of that doing it better and part of that doing it right is asking kids to construct their understanding and to use and to, and to think about how the past impacts, impacts the present. And that's really another plug for using visible thinking routines. It helps organize their thinking, organize their speech, organize their discussion. I saw Jennifer asking about uh, kids not willing to talk. Multiple teachers use visible thinking routines as a prep before conversation. And then lastly, um, when I go into a class, either online or, you know, or, or traditional, uh, and it's already maybe November or beyond, and a teacher says, we're going to use uh, See, Think, Wonder. We're going to use Connect, Extend, Challenge. By that point, the routine part of Visible Think Routine is in place. And kids know right away what to do. And they're already going to be, have already begun to shift their thinking in that way. And that is uh, definitely a benefit. So that's what I wanted to end my segment in. Sorry, uh, uh, Jennifer and Joe. Thank you both for the additional time. And Joe, handing it off to you. Thank you, Craig. Um, actually, that was a great segue to my presentation because if if it is uh, true that most students last history classes in high school, that can be also very terrifying and exciting because who is the last history teacher that they had? Um, so let me just give me a second here to share my screen. Um, so again, uh, thank you, thank you all for uh, being here and uh, to my panelists, thank you for your presentations as well. Um, so again, my name is Joe Sebastian. I'm an assistant principal at a high school in just outside of Pittsburgh. I used to be a social studies teacher uh, in Fairfax County. Um, I was, I taught my, during my tenure, IB History of the Americas, and I would really emphasize that that, that kind of really taught me how to hit, teach history well. Um, and I am also an adjunct professor for this uh, community college that trains professionals becoming teachers. And some of the practices that I share with them is that, you know, I, I, I always strive to be their favorite teacher, the student's favorite teacher. And, and students that came back over that Thanksgiving break pre-COVID, uh, you know, that would uh, come to your classroom and visit you. Um, 
I always was curious like what they were doing and what they were learning. And the biggest compliment to me was um, my teaching and help them improve their essay writing or help them improve their critical thinking skills. Um, they express it in different ways, of course, but I kind of got that from the feedback I got. And I tell future social studies teachers that they're really not going to remember dates as much as we love dates and we love specific things about our history. They don't necessarily remember that. Um, so it kind of leads into the critical thinking process of I stole this this skill from the IB curriculum and kind of brought it to other schools that I've gone to. And the skill um, that specifically is taught in the IB curriculum is OPCVL, stands for Origin, Purpose, uh, Content, Value, Limitation. And we're going to get into it a little bit more. Um, but it's a skill that I think can be scaled uh, for any history class. Um, not just IB, because it's all about evaluating sources. So kind of an overview of what I'm going to run through. Um, if I do run short on time, um, I do talk fast, but I, I every all the presentation is up on my on the toolkit, um, along with a guide that you can use in your classroom um, with your students. There's also a reference sheet and there's a practice problem on there and how we're going to walk through if we, get to, if we have time. So um, I'd like to start with the why, the urgency, um, you know, the goal of social studies, the goal of history, I think, is to make productive, engaging citizens, positive, productive, engaging citizens, our society, especially at the K-12 level, um, to provide critical thinking um, taking place outside the classroom. Uh, and so it terrifies me when <laughs> students tell me, sometimes adults, that they get all their news from Twitter, or um, I, did the re I did the research on the internet. Um, so a lot of students think they know things, or a lot of adults think they know things when they actually don't, right? Because where are you getting this information from? The, the things, and I, again, I'm going to, I'm going to dive, skim on the politics a little bit, uh, not go too far in deep, but like the last two election cycles that we have, just the insanity around quote unquote fake news. Uh, but it is a real problem with our society. And, you know, we're going through something our demo with our democracy. And if we as teachers don't really get this thing right, um, I don't know where we're gonna be. So I do see that as the role we play in our society, um, creating engaged, informed, productive citizens. Um, <clears throat> when I was kind of updating my research for this presentation um, and I went you know, back to the Pew Research Center, uh, the, the number of people getting their news from social media is growing rapidly, if you probably can imagine this. These, this data is from 2019, 2020. Um, so that social media is fastly becoming the majority. And um, and I think we'll, I, I think we take for granted because obviously, we're, you know, we're from a different generation than our students. Um, millennials really aren't in the classroom anymore. It's now Generation Z who have grown up entirely with the internet um, and not just the dial up internet that we probably used to know as kids or, young, or younger adults, um, but really the social media, the, the social networking, and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not a social media expert in how the algorithms work and talk about that, but that is something that is completely different than even how I grew up. Cause, uh, you know, my dad used to turn on the news at, at six o'clock, the six thirty evening news. Um, he had three or four stations to watch, um, used to read newspapers. All that's kind of going, uh, by the wayside, people still get their news, but social media is probably the fastest growing aspect of it um and especially holds true for political news as well for people under 30 sorry my, i don't know if i cut out there i'm sorry about that okay so um again social media for the younger age groups age groups so probably the, the last part of the millennials and the generation's years they're getting their news from social media that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing but again when we factor in the algorithms of what they're actually reading it's important, and I'll get that into a second. But even in history, right, we we do evaluate sources, and the stories we hear aren't necessarily historically accurate. Case in point, Paul Revere's ride. Um, if we were to analyze the story or analyze the source, it's way different from the hero that we know of as Paul Revere. And of course, the historically accurate uh, Spartans who did not wear body armor at the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, 300, and how that was depicted in the movie versus what actually happened at Thermopylae. Um, so keep that in mind too. Kind of pull these from um, the, actually I saw this on Business Insider, the top 10 
news stories, uh, fake news stories on social media. And I'm not, again, I'm not trying to dive into the politics. I'm just showing you what is seen by people on social media when they interact with this. They just see that little square of a headline, a, an attention grabbing headline with a picture and something to provoke emotions. It looks real. It looks like a legitimate news source. If this was a New York Times posting, it looks exactly the same. The problem with Facebook, the problem with Twitter is it gives everything equal weight in terms of how it's interacted. And so the news looks real, but if you don't know how to evaluate the source for bias, then you think well, this, this has to be true. Um, so there's just a couple examples of what is out there and what people can be interacting with. And of course, the more you interact with these sources, the more sources just like this you're going to get. Um, I doubt people look at media bias, um, <coughs> excuse me, but unless you're following specific news sites to kind of adjust your bias, if you're trying to go down the center, um, you're gonna get pulled more one way or the other, depending on what you interact with. So getting to, um, OPVCL. Um, it used to be OPVL, but they added content. So this is a tool from the IB curriculum. I believe we must teach the skill uh, how to properly evaluate sources. So my favorite phrase that Mr. Perrier has shared with me is whoever is doing the work is doing the learning. I do like that um, to, to teach teachers how to teach certainly OPVCL. <clears throat> um, just a little cartoon there, one second, sorry. <clears throat> so um, I would, I pulled this from a kind of PowerPoint of how I used to teach students this skill. Um, all the sources we interact with must be approached with caution, right? You can't just take something for its as word. Um, you have to consider who wrote it, um, when they wrote it, what's being told, what's being left out. That's all this that's wrapped up in this acronym. And so it applies across, you know, all points, but definitely applies in the history, his, uh, history curriculum, the social studies curriculum. So um, <clears throat> when we're weighing sources, we don't really, you know, primary, secondary is just, is second to what we're trying to evaluate. So it, it, we can do this with a primary source. We can do this with a secondary source. Um, and it, you'll see in a moment as we do Declaration of Independence. So I would break it down to my students and I'll just put this up there. You guys can certainly read it, but origin obviously stands for, you know, what is it? Is it a book? Is it a, is it a document, a speech? Who's the author? When was it written? An example I'll give, um, you know, Mao or Ho Chi Minh have different interpretations of their uh, respective civil conflicts than the American government who supported it. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about the origin. This, these, these three first, uh, letters are pretty self-explanatory. They can be done pretty quickly. Uh, there we go. Purpose. Um, when, why was this written? What, what was his intended audience? What's the perspective? Um, is the information fact, opinion, or propaganda? So for example, is this textbook that is written to inform a high school student or a press conference given to reassure the American public? Uh, so that's the important piece. Then comes content. Now this was like an added in um, when IB revised their standards, but what information does the source provide? Because if it doesn't provide any useful information, what's the point, right? What's the tone of the source? Um, so that is an important piece as well when considering this, this document. And then we kind of go into the deeper part of the skill is that, okay, the value and the limitation. So, um, Anyone can write a source, just like those uh, sources that I showed you a little earlier, but does the author have any special qualifications? When we taught the, um, the IA, the internal assessment from IB, um, and students had to provide their own research to answer a research question that they came up with, you know, we made them look into the authors, like, is this an actual historian? Uh, or are they just someone writing something? Um, so what are those qualifications? Is it an authentic document um, that hasn't been changed? Um, is it a product of the times? Um, you know, things written now are a lot different from things that were written 100, 200, 300 years ago. 
Um, so that is all important when looking at a document or a source. And then again, the opposite of value is there's limitation. Um, bias, right? How do, you, how do you teach bias? Well, does the account express only one point of view? And we're going to get into bias is not necessarily a bad thing, but that also leads to, is there stuff many, missing in this document? Um, of course, we see great examples if we, if we try to break down propaganda from World War II for the Nazis uh, or from the Axis or even, you know, the Allies. Propaganda has a certain bias towards it. It's trying to tell you something. And again, we'll kind of go over this when we're teaching the skill. Being biased does not limit the value of the source. You know, who is it biased towards? Who is it against? What part of the story does it leave out? So it is important to kind of discuss these things. So now I'll get into, I don't know how much time I have left. Sorry, I lost the chat feature here. But, um, you know, how do you use this in a classroom? Well, we will start with the Declaration of Independence because it's, thank you, Craig, <laughs> because it's something everyone usually knows. Uh, you know, the first thing that most K-12 students want to know about is where is that treasure map and does it lead to gold as Nicolas Cage, the predominant historian, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> was taught us about, um, uh, about the Declaration of Independence. Can you still hear me? My, my headphone battery is back. Okay. Sorry. Um, so we'll, we'll literally go through the Declaration of Independence, breaking it down. Um, and we'll ask what type of document it is, when and where it was produced, who produced it. When we look at purpose, um, and so I'm sorry. So how they're answering this and I'll, it, um, the practice for the, the sheet that's on the toolkit has this broken down. We want kids to write, we want kids to interact with this. So either they're writing you know, in class or in COVID times, they're interacting with the Google Doc or they're, or they're doing this remotely, um, but we want them to write in one or two sentences state and origin and then the purpose. Um, <clears throat> who was the intended audience? For what purpose was it written? And so then I'll provide them some keywords that possibly use here, as you can see there. <clears throat> and then, content in one or two sentences state the major content within the source. So it's just basically those important facts, those details that go along with the author's purpose. When we get to value and limitation, we want them to write longer paragraphs because obviously it's, it's going deeper into that higher level thinking. So we want them to write a paragraph explaining the, per, the, the value of the document and the limitation. And we want them to hit on a couple values. Um, within the documents, not just limit it with one. And I'll usually give them when I'm, I'm teaching this, whether it's 12th grade or ninth grade, we'll do, we'll do sentence starters. By the end of the year, I, I'm not going to be providing this for them. I want them to kind of graduate, go up and be able to use stuff on their own. But as you can see that this document is valuable because, and it shows this. <clears throat> and then again, same thing for limitation. We want two limitations for the present in the same sentence starters. So, um, and maybe as a first kind of checkout point of the skill in the first week that I introduced this, I'll have this whole sentence start to fill in the blank. I will scale that back and take that away because I want that, I want that historical thinking skills to take over as they uh, really start to analyze and diagnose different sources. So, Couple of things to leave you with. Uh, this quote by Abraham Lincoln, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. Obviously not real. <laughs> and then the trouble with quotes, I, this is in one of my history teacher's uh, rooms on the internet is that you never know how genuine you are. But I will leave you with the facts are stubborn things uh, from John Adams. So I appreciate your time. Um, thank you all. Uh, and back to you, Craig. Oh, let me stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, panelists. Um, we all did really well on time. We have, it's 310. We have, a, we've, I've been looking at the comments in the chat. Um, I've lost some when I got bumped out. So I'm gonna have to rely on some of my panelists and maybe Debbie or Victor to make sure we, we uh, as we transition to our question, our Q and A uh, at part of the, of today. Um, that we do get uh, address as many questions as we can. Um, and once again, if you remember, if you, if you uh, 
there's a question that's not there, if you're on the pallet, we're going to follow up with you within the week with uh, to, to get the network going. But um, uh, other is there? I'm not sure how to approach this, Debbie. Is, is there, or Victor? Is there a, a question and answer that you give us, or is there? Is there? I lost them all when I got bumped out. I think I, I'm only seeing one. I think there's more. There was originally more than one. Okay, great. So if I see the one that's from uh, Joseph Schmidt, um, he starts off with a compliment. These presentations are wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, what, are the, what are the best ways for us to collectively move forward defining and describing K-16 learning progressions? Wow, first, so substantive concepts and second order concepts in history ed. So um, this sounds like a very, uh, it sounds like vertical articulation and uh, how do we address that? Does that sound like maybe a place we can start? Trevor, you want to start us off? Yeah, and let me just say, I, I mean, I've got a copy of Lisa Cap's question, which was specifically for you that I can read to you after this. But Joe, I mean, Joe does a lot of really great thinking around these kinds of things. I, I, I mean, I want to start by recognizing the AHA Gateways uh, project and that, you know, the AHA is really providing leadership to think about these kinds of things, um, which is very helpful because there aren't that many other structures for it. I mean, there are organic coming togethers of, of, of um, a few teachers and a few college professors like this one, but in general, um, there's not a huge amount of, of uh, emphasis as to how we can really think about high school to college as a progression. And that's been true over a, a long period of time. Um, I see there's a little thing that popped up that said American Historical Association is gonna answer this question live. I'm not sure quite what that means. Does anybody know? No, all right, well, I'm no. done there. I, I wanted to point <laughs> to the Gateways Project. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And, and, and I'll, if I can, oh, sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, uh, I mean, this is one of the, um, this is one of the big things that we've been talking about in History Sotal. Um, and uh, I know Trevor and Joe and I had had this conversation at the last ASA, or the last AHA. Um, to some degree, I think, um, you know, it, to some degree, it's a question of resources. So for us, you know, we would like, we're in the process of trying to think through and it's gotten bogged down by COVID, of course, but, you know, how to create a website that would provide that opportunity to have those conversations, a space um, that would be open to K through 16 um, kinds of um, conversations and, and would be, um, and, and would have a range of resources. I think, you know, as, a, as an organization, we don't have resources ourselves. And so being able to fund the website is a challenge, right? Um, so if somebody wants to partner up, give me a shout, because uh, we, don't, we don't have fees or dues. Um, but, but I think, you know, those kind. I mean, that, that's me being self-serving for the organization, but I think those kinds of partnerships are really important, right? So I think, you know, Trevor's point about these kinds of informal gatherings happening, um, and the AHA doing doing history gateways is great, but I think the formal partnerships between professional organizations are really powerful and signal something really important to people on um, in in the university education and in K through twelve education um, that that I think otherwise doesn't get put forward. Um, and I know, like you know, for us, you know, we we have challenges engaging with the Detroit public school system. Um, it's not impossible, but it's really hard. And to get those inroads, it's 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 a really difficult thing. And, and different school systems are organized differently. Um, but even con like we can't even get email addresses to individual teachers because of the way that websites are organized now, right? So, um, you know, to to find to find those connections can be challenging. And so I think I think you know there has to be ways that we can that we can partner institutionally, um, or you know school systems connecting to history departments at local universities and vice versa and like trying to make those connections kind of institutionally um, rich so that so that it encourages the the practitioners the instructors on both sides of the spectrum to engage i just have a quick comment about this to add on to jennifer and trevor's and maybe if joe if you don't we can if you do that's great if not we can go on to another question but really quickly you know jennifer hinted to it there's no national education system <laughs> right? Uh, it's different from state to state, from uh, counties and districts within the state. Um, so that's a major challenge uh, to Joe's question. How do we do it? Um, to end on a positive here. Uh, one thing that what I don't know if it's ever been explored, but because we don't have this, um, you know, 
state or national uh, effort to say, yes, when you graduate high school, you should be able to do this because of the variance. We do have to rely on partnerships and organizations. And I think that from my perspective, um, it, you know, the, the NCSS, National Council for Teaching and Social Studies and, and the AHA, um, if they were to join forces, I think it would be a powerful way to have, have some, some shared articulation by at least members of those institute or organizations, but also as one that can demonstrate with some clarity uh, across, um, across K-16. Although, although, I mean, we also have to recognize that even, you know, the attempt to create a common core set of standards <laughs> ran up against the problems of trying right. to do that, which is, I mean, it is, it is, it is very difficult. Um, yeah. So, so can I read this? So because it, it came in first, um, can I read this question to you, Craig, um, that Lisa Kapp put up? She said, Craig, thank you. These remote friendly, collaborative friendly activity templates are phenomenal. I'd love to see how this works in progress. She said, can you walk through how you you guide students through here now, there, that, here now, there, then, which was one of them. I don't know if you have time to do that right now or if there's some way. I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll, well, I'll answer it this way. So I've never used here now, there, then. It's one that uh, students have, it's one that uh, some teachers have. Um, but to this point, um, uh, I guess maybe two things. One is the first thing is that uh, the, some, thinking, some thinking routines are very easy to implement. Um, and they're, self, they're, they're you know, almost self-evident. Other ones take, they're longer, they take time. Uh, uh, on, my, on my team, in, my, in our professional learning, we use uh, one called compass points. And it's, it's really good when something new is interjected and the compass points are north, south, east, west. You can, one area is for what's, what do you still need to know? What excites you? What worries you? What's your current stance or suggestion for the, but that takes time, right? That takes multiple, it's not a five minute, you know, 20 minutes minimum at least to explain it and then actively have that time for people to do it. So I guess the, the, the how to do it, thankfully, when you click on the link that goes to project zero, they have ideas for implementation, right? And how to actually implement each separate, individually for each routine, not, a, not just a general one. So I would have to direct you there, but, um, uh, a, a final point about thinking routines is that the culture and community around visible thinking is that uh, hack them as you need to, means modify them. And it's not like you're breaking a rule, <laughs> right? Uh, besides like the idea behind visible thinking. Uh, there's there's a tons of hacks. Uh, a hack can be simply mentioning the, the compass points routine, changing what the, changing what the point is, north, south, east, west. Uh, I've used W instead of worries. I've used um, what do you want to share <laughs> with colleagues, right? Uh, as opposed uh, as opposed to a worry area. Uh, another hack is, for example, um, there was one you saw that's called word phrase sentence. Uh, the routine asked that everyone does all three. Ask students to do pick two to do instead of instead of three. So hacking and modifying is is part of the culture. I hope that helps with um, uh, oh wonder W wonder is great. Yeah, I hope that helps with. Uh, um, your question, Lisa. Uh, are there any more questions? In, are, there, are there any more questions in the Q and A? There, there is. There, there's a question from Allison Height, which I was trying to type an answer to because I thought we might not have enough time. She said, um, and I want to open this to any of the other panelists as well. Can I give an, an any example of classroom activities or assignments, especially in college level survey classes that I use to promote scale switching skills? And I was just typing that, I mean, you know, for me, this is really unit, this, these are unit long exercises and here's how I do it, right? I, I you know, I, I, I start with a, with a proposition, I find a polemical text. Um, so, you know, for me, because I'm really focusing on, right now on the age of revolutions kind of stuff, I give them, I give students Palmer's argument, which is basically the Atlantic revolutions are the result of, you know, the European fiscal military state and the enlightenment and such. And, and we take it as the starting point. And then I, I try to subtly give them lots of stuff that can, they don't even necessarily realize will, will raise questions such as, um, you know, reading the, the Declaration of Independence of Haiti, um, looking at and studying the Islamic uprisings, especially Usman Don Fodio and such in West Africa, stuff that doesn't seem to fit in at all. Um, and then we, we go into breakout rooms and I say, fit this into the argument that into Palmer's argument. And of course, you know, so this is college, so it is a little less structured than maybe I should do it right now. Um, but 
what what they find is oh there's no way to fit that the islamic you know the islamic movements in west africa were totally different uh, until you learn that uh, many uh, very often they were against the same kind of fiscal military states very often really it's the the economic changes across the atlantic and yeah they're a different I ideology but these islamic uh, sufi movements in in west africa were also kind of you know new ideas and liberation uh, movements and maybe they'll believe it or maybe they won't but the point of the point of that unit is um, to get students to maybe they'll confirm at the end, um, but but to get students to use this kind of different evidence to use Vince Brown's argument that really we should be looking at the Atlantic revolutions partly in terms of this long struggle of slaves against enslavers, and that that's the right scope to do part of this at. Um, so that that's unit long rather than sort of individual classroom. For individual for individual classes uh, kinds of things, um, I, I showed I showed a couple of examples that California history uh, project one, which is it's 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 in my toolbox now toolbox toolbox now for you to look at. But um, it's it's kind of great because what they do is they say, hey, our proposition there is that there was an interconnected medieval world. Now, what I wish they did is gave us a few examples of places that really weren't interconnected necessarily as well, so that they'd be more critical, you know, because the students are obviously, you know, you look at Calicut and then you look at, at, at Cairo and you go, yeah, exchange is happening in all these places. And I can kind of tell how they're happening by look at, looking at each individual place and the sources within them. Um, but, but I mean, for me, that's a great example. These all take a while, they're not single classroom exercises. Um, but, but I find that, they, that they're really useful. I don't know if anybody else has an example or, or thought. I was gonna transition, Trevor, to a question that we had as, as, a, as part of our panel discussion. You know, our, our, our panel today was, is, is based on the idea that um, changing how history is taught is really important. And it, maybe people can uh, you know, infer that uh, what we're aiming at at some level is higher student agency in the practice of learning history, right? And, and as, as, so um, uh, as opposed to being uh, uh, teaching as telling, <laughs> right? Teaching as a constructivist process where your kids are agents of their, of their understanding and, and get feedback and, and can practice. So I'm gonna, this is for the panel, I'm gonna combine kind of two questions we had so you can take either uh, uh, or, or both, right? And one is um, maybe we can we can we can you can kind of contemplate what are some risks of not changing history education based on what I just mentioned, meaning not changing it from teaching as telling to teaching as a, as an, as the students are being agents and, and being active, uh, and then and then um, in doing so in, in making that change, is there any advice that you have from your experience on how to make those changes? Uh, occur. So I'm going to, I'm going to let that out there, let it kind of simmer and see who wants to start. Uh, I mean, I can definitely talk about that. I mean, I, I just, I, it's absolutely critical. I, um, I think I talk a lot about how sometimes historians are not as transparent as we could be, or as other disciplines are about the kinds of methods that we use and the, and what we do when we do our work. I think there's a sort of mythology around history work. Um, and I, I think historians get annoyed at that, at that mythology and the way it sometimes works against us. But I think sometimes we're also participating in creating it, right? By, by not being transparent about method and not um, being transparent about the kinds of skills. And I understand the, the reservation about the balance between skills and content. But I think, um, you know, being able to articulate what we do, like literally what we do, not the content, necessarily, right? But like, why is this beneficial? That's exactly the kinds of things that Joe was mentioning, right? Like, why is prime, like primary source analysis and source analysis is very essential to helping people understand and develop information literacy, right? Um, not to mention civic awareness and all kinds of other things. Um, but I think we collectively have to be better and a lot more transparent about explaining what we do, not only to help people I mean, in part to help students develop those skills, right? If we can't explicitly say what they are, how are, how are we possibly teaching them properly and how are students possibly understanding what they're supposed to be learning, but also to explain what we're contributing. I mean, 
to be honest, you know, uh, so many people, right, actually literally question why people should take a history course. Why should we be offering history at the K through 12 level or at the university level? There's threats to this all the time. It happens in every generation in some form. And if it keeps happening, then clearly we're not making the argument clearly. And, and then just, it, we have to be more active in that. Can I, can I second that and just say, um, so, so I think, I think that there are kind of, I mean, I've been convinced by Bob Bain a, a, a little bit um, that primary source analysis is so key, but then understanding how primary sources get turned into narratives is the second part. I mean, when we talk about Joe's, Joe's presentation really, you know, it speaks to me because, you know, we, we have this, you know, this clear target. It's, it's clear that students haven't learned enough social studies and history. It's clear that, that, that they don't know how to necessarily navigate the information that they're getting. But part of that is pulling apart primary sources and looking at context and looking at sourcing and stuff like that. The, another part of it is seeing how power is exerted when those primary sources get turned into narratives and being able to reverse engineer a narrative that they receive to see whether the evidence is any good or not and, and that sort of thing. So. I think they both, yeah, I agree with, I agree with Catherine uh, Strabanek in the, in the comments, they scale, right? They're, they're connected, these things. Um, I'm trying to convince Joe Schmidt, by the way, to put in the comments, some of the tools they use in New York around scale switching that might be useful. I'm hoping he gets to that before we finish here. And he nice. just did. Nice, thanks, Joe, thank you very much. Um, I, I'll, I'll jump in and give you, and give a kind of a, advice or something I've learned working with teachers to make these shifts. It's, it's really simple. Um, and it talks to a, a educator's belief in themselves and, and in the power of change. And that is, uh, if something bombs once, you don't give up on it, right? So uh, it's quite possible that students you have have um, not experienced anything that we, we just presented on today. That means they have nine to 14 years or, or so of, of believing that history class means you tell me what I need to <laughs> say back to you on a test. And that's what, and that's what history teaching is. And history, it's, it's an exercise in memorization. So uh, you, might, you might find a collection of students who are gonna have to be kind of re, uh, what did Yoda say? You know, learn what, unlearn what you've learned or something, right? And you need to relearn what history education is about. So if something doesn't go perfectly the first time, you don't give up on it. Right, you continue, right? You explain and, and you and you support student learning in that way. That's that's one thing that I've I've um, uh, I've seen teachers uh, grow from, right? From that kind of disposition about change. And and for me, it's all teaching the IB curriculum at Fairfax kind of really opened me up to this. It, it's what we ask our students to do. Um, so how you shift from going to telling to like actually teaching students how to learn. Um, I always simplified as the first, the first essay question we had in our curriculum was to what extent did slavery cause the civil war? Now, there's no right or wrong answer to that question. And that's what where students who have taken honors classes all of their uh, high school career are baffled by that. What do you mean there's no right answer? No, it's you could take any position on this question as long as you can prove it with solid evidence and explanation. And, and so watching them engage with it, and to Trevor's point, you have to know multiple perspectives on sources. You have to know some primary sources, secondary sources. You have to know all the primary causes of the Civil War to argue to that point that your whatever stance you take on answering that question is the right one, right? And, and this is this should be right because of this. So um, really watching students kind of take that first question we asked in our course and grow from it because those are those kind of open-ended questions on I'm, I'm inviting you to dive into the history curriculum. We're going to learn a lot of different things along the way, but in the end, you're going to tell me based on what we learn and how you weigh these sources of one against another. Um, I also, th I also think, um, oh yeah, we are out of time, but uh, I was just going to say, I, I think, uh, you know, related to some of the things that everybody's been saying is, um, you know, right now we're in the midst of thinking about what it means to decolonize history and the history curriculum and the kinds of narratives that, that we have and the received narratives that we have. And, and I think to do any of the work that we've talked about today, we really have to be willing and able to challenge the grand narratives that come in textbooks or that students have received through their, through their throughout life. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we all have to be part of that project. And, and as the AHA picks that up, I really hope that they engage and embrace 
um, conversations with K through 12 partners who are also an incredible part of that process. Thank you. Um, uh, that concludes our, our webinar today. A uh, recording of the conversation will be available on the AHA YouTube channel soon. And you can also find recordings of past virtual AHA events on that channel. Um, I'd like to thank again our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. Uh, since this is a teaching audience, I thought I would also put in a plug for our Thursday webinar, webinar on teaching pre-modern women and gender. Uh, thanks again to everyone who submitted questions and contributed to the very lively chat. And a special thanks to our panelists today. Have a great day. Thank you.